I'm going to speak about uh, lower or PCP theorems. And particularly on the joint work with uh, Ran Raz from 2008. Yes, I'm going to speak about. Yes, yes. Okay. Good. So, so let's let's remind ourselves what the PCP theorem is. Uh, so, the PCP theorem. says that if you want to check whether this is a valid proof for some mathematical statement, say that this is a, a valid proof for the Riemann hypothesis, or, or whatever that you can, whatever you can uh, express as some propositional calculus formula, right? To check whether this is a valid proof, like there are symbols written here, whether this is a valid proof for uh, the Riemann hypothesis, well, you need to check that every, um, every uh, claim follows from the previous claims and that the end result is, is uh, the, the, the Riemann hypothesis is true. So, so this can be expressed by, by a propositional calculus formula. And like, the PCP theorem says that we don't really have to read the entire proof in order to, to check whether the, the statement is uh, correct or not. We can just construct another proof carefully construct another proof. Um, thank you. Wow, it was color. Uh, yes. Uh, we can construct another proof. The, other, uh, the new proof will be longer than the original proof and will be over uh, a larger, possibly larger alphabet. And the new proof, uh, it suffices to check in only two places cho chosen in some probabilistic manner, and will be pretty like will be uh, sufficiently convinced that if the test accepts, then the, the statement is, is true. So we have completeness. Every valid proof can be transformed into a proof that is always accepted, and soundness. Uh, if there is no proof here, then also for any proof here, the probability we accept is so for any proof. The probability of accept is at most epsilon, and epsilon is called the error of the of the PCP, and we want it to be as small uh, as possible. And this this lecture is going to be about how small epsilon can be. Okay. Now, in particular, we are going to be interested in uh, projection games. What are projection games? In projection games, this, this huge proof here is not just one chunk. It's actually composed of uh, two chunks, chunk A, which is, say, up to here, and chunk B, which is up to here. And we even allow different alphabets here. Symbols can be over alphabet sigma A. Sigma a here, uh, symbols can be over alphabet sigma B. And we want that the tester will always make one query to the A part, one query to the B part. And moreover, we want to say something about the nature of the test that the verifier makes. And this nature, actually, we'll, we'll refer to, to draw it this way. Here is the A chunk. Here is the B chunk. Each test can be thought of as, a, uh, as an edge in this bipartite graph. And the, the, the test that we make is a projection test, meaning that this, if this is A and B and E is, is A comma B, then we have this projection pi of E that given the symbol that is written here tells us what is the symbol that we accept, the, that we expect to find here. And the test accepts if and only if the projection is satisfied. Now, why are we interested in this structure? Well, uh, 20 years of, of, of uh, research of, of PCP of, and harness of approximation 
showed us that if we have low error PCP with this structure, then we can get lots and lots of uh, hardness of approximation results. It turns out that this particular structure is extremely important. And really, almost all, all, all the results, the hardness results that I can think of uh, used, use uh, such structures. Such structure and some use the, the stronger structure where this, this uh, projection is also a permutation. This is unique games. But, but we're not talking about unique games. Well, right now, because also we don't really know how to get uh, uh, unique games. We're just interested in projection games, and this already suffices for many hardness of approximation results. In particular, uh, the result for free sat and free lean and click and so on and so on. Okay. Now we need we need an observation, and the observation I think that Or also said it uh, yesterday is that. So let's call sigma uh, sigma a. Theory and sigma b. The the claim is that sigma has to be at least 1 over epsilon. Because if the alphabet is really small, then we can satisfy epsilon fraction of the, of the constraint simply by choosing the assignments here uh, at random. And this is expected to satisfy it all. So in order to get low error, we have to pay in the alphabet. And so we are, when we are talking about low error, we have, we have this. And a note, so, uh, so the question is how tight this inequality. And this inequality is not tight. Uh, actually, uh, sigma must be larger, more, more larger than this. <laughs> well, uh, but, but this is essentially the, the order of magnitude. The, the alphabet should be inverse polynomial in, in one over epsilon. And what we'll show today is, is a suboptimal result where uh, the, the alphabet is exponential in, in one over epsilon. But yes. Is there no lower bound you can predict on this? <coughs> yes, no. yes, yes. Uh, there is a work of Hast, who was apparently a student of Hastat, and who showed that actually there should be another logarithmic in one over epsilon factor here. Um, yes. And I'm not sure, so, uh, and I think that this is, this is essentially tight. And all the works, the works of on linearity testing, like Smorodinsky, Travis, and actually show that you can obtain something like this with the logarithmic factor. So I think that the constants here are not really known, but essentially we understand what, what is the right trade-off here. But in any case, the right trade-off No, no, fine. They have results for a constant epsilon. We yeah, want to talk, constant. yes, for constant. And, and we seem to believe that it should also be true for, for yeah, the non-constant. Okay. Really no, no, uh, yes, it's not known. And, and I'll, I'll speak about the, the, the best known, like the, the best result currently known, which is uh, to get any error epsilon we want, but uh, with, with the, the wrong trade. If you want larger epsilon, you can achieve the, the, the right trade. This is a summary of what I said. Good. Um, yes. So we need another observation. This is also something that was mentioned in uh, the talk yesterday. And the observation is that we can always talk about two queries and projection tests if we don't care about the error. If we are willing to have error which is almost one, then, then everything is fine. If we have PCP verifier uh, with Q queries and error epsilon, then we can obtain from it projection uh, verifier, meaning that the number of queries is two, but 
but the error yes with error one minus one over q plus epsilon over q and if epsilon is 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 small and q is so we really have this one minus one over q okay so if we're willing to have such a huge error then like to get projection games is not a problem the only problem is how to get uh, projection games when the error is small and not so this now how how is this proved so this is a useful trick the trick is to uh, put on one side on the a side all the uh, randomness all the verifier randomness and to put on the other side the proof and to connect randomness to a proof symbol here are all the proof symbols if on randomness r we actually make this query and what we know is that uh, almost always except in epsilon um, probability this test cannot be satisfied, meaning that at least one of those, so here we're making Q queries. So at least one of the Q is going to be falsified and, and thus we get this. Okay. But why is this projection? There are many ways in which you can make a mistake. Oh, I, I should have said, no. So I should have said that an assignment here is, uh, please tell me what are all the uh, symbols that you're going to check over sigma to the Q. Okay, and, and this, is, this is a projection test. Thank you. Okay. Yes, so, so all this talk is going to be about getting a projection verifier when the error is, is small. So what, what was known? So let me let me draw the, the arrow axis for you. So let's see if this is so let's put the arrow here. <laughs> so this is going to be error one, which which is doesn't mean a thing, and this is error zero, which we don't expect uh, to achieve if we want if we want a probabilistic local uh, local check and so i'm going to put two benchmarks on this axis two benchmarks which were extremely important in the study of, of pcps so one is to get 0 0.9999 and, and when, I write, when i write this i mean some constant which is bounded away from one i don't really care about what is the value here but but a very large value but constant bounded away from one now we are going to make a huge jump. We are not going to draw the entire axis. And the, other, the, the, the next benchmark is going to be 0 0.0001. And here when I mean, when I write 0001, I don't really mean this number. I mean any constant as small as, as we want. So these were two uh, benchmarks, but of course there is a lot of place here and here, and then let's see what, what was the history. Okay, so let's, so to get error which is one minus, one minus one over poly n, it's n, n to the c. So to get such uh, error, this is just the NP hardness result for, for uh, the, the projection games. So this was known from the 70s. The, the interesting thing is to get something which is better than this. And the, the, in a big surprise, it was achieved, it was shown that we can get polylogan, 1 minus 1 over polylogan. This is BFLS in 91. Okay. 
So what they showed is actually a, a test that makes polylogarithmic number of queries. And by this observation, we get, we get this. So this is all Most for... What? Yes. So yes, everything was a sequence of, of works no, and, and all the, the okay. Yeah, of course there are a lot of things we will not have very nice things. I know the grid test appears in BFL and then what made it BFL. So BFL, Baba I thought now in Bloom. Um yeah, so this was this was a huge breakthrough that you can actually get polylogarithmic number. Uh, next, Aurora and Safra in '92 showed that you could get one over one minus one over poly. Yes, so in the presentation I had like yes, 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 log log n to the c. Okay, so we l we lost another. Uh, logarithmic factor, and then finally um, LMSS the same year uh, got the, the constant. And now, of course, this is not a very interesting error. What we really want is very small error. And then this was the, the next uh, the, the next challenge. Yes. What? You cannot get this some simple iteration from the 0.99. If you want not projection with games, not with a fixed you want two, a two queries and projection yeah. between them. If you are if you are willing to do sequential repetition, yeah. and yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's why I, I added this. So, uh, so how do we get arbitrarily small error? So there was the work of Feige and Killian which originally didn't give a projection game, but then uh, later found a way to make the, the construction of projection game. And this result was uh, subsumed by, by Ran Raz in 94, who proved the parallel repetition theorem. And the parallel repetition theorem preserves uh, projection, and so we could get arbitrarily small, small error. So the, the big advantage of this over this, so, so first it's the it's easier operation, and also the the error here, the the trade-off between the error and the, um, and the alphabet was was optimal here. Okay, but the the parallel partition theorem could only give error which is constant, and and the reason is that the length becomes uh, the the exponent of the length depends on one over epsilon, so, so we can't get a uh, sub-constant error if we want a polynomial size. And so the, the, the next question was, can we get lower, uh, lower error, error that depends on n, that goes to zero as n tends to infinity? And then there, was, there were the works of uh, Aurora Sudan and Raz Zafra in 97 that showed that you can get error which is uh, 2 to the minus log n to beta. And this beta means that there exists a global constant beta such that you can achieve error this small. Yeah, so this is, this is a big, a big step. Um, the, the only problem is that they didn't show this for projection games. They showed this for a, a number of queries which is larger than two. They couldn't get uh, projection games. And actually, the result for Q equals three wasn't even written in any of those papers. What was written was some sketch of a result for Q equals five, I think. Um, but it was folklore that you can achieve Q equals three. So this is no longer, this is no projection game. And then there was another work by uh, DFKRS 
who said, okay, if we're willing to, to let the number of queries not be two, you know, why not take the full advantage of it? So they could give two to the minus log n to the one minus alpha for any alpha as long as q is some polynomial with one over alpha, yes. which is very far from a, from a projection game. And the motivation is that there is this interesting uh, question whether we can get the error to be one over n to the beta for some constant beta. So this is, this is a conjecture like that we can arrive to here and we, we don't know how to do With that. Any of With any no constant number of queries. Though now uh, the, the, the more interesting question is whether we can get it for projection games. Uh, but they, they wanted to get as close as possible to here and, and this is where they stopped. Okay, so uh, the, the message is that projection games <coughs> stopped here. From here on, uh, all those stuff were, were not projection games and, and this is what we're trying to do to get projection games uh, in, in the subconstant error regime and what, what we are able to do is to get error which is uh, one, one over log n to the beta for some constant beta which is, which is much uh, larger than this by an exponential here. Uh, but still it goes, it tends to zero as, as uh, n tends to infinity and so it's, it's better than the power repetition theorem. Okay, so this is, this is what we're trying to do. So, what? We are going for projection games. We are going to uh, have error one over log n to the beta. Not as low as we can achieve for non-projection, but still uh, qualitatively better than, than what, we, what could be achieved for projection games before. Um, Okay, so, so let me write exactly what the theorem we prove. So the theorem uh, from 2008 is this, uh, there exists some constant gamma between zero and one, such that for every n and epsilon, which is a function of n, but the function which is at least polynomially uh, uh, large, proofs, proof of size of length n can be efficiently converted to proofs that can be checked probabilistically by projection verifier. This is the, the key point here. Uh, with error epsilon. Now, the, the point, I, I'm not done yet, so, so if. Is that really an n or is that supposed to be a log n? No, n. What? No, 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 this is right. Yeah. I haven't finished because there is, a, no. there is the point no. where the alphabet, log the size of the alphabet is polynomial in one over epsilon. And this is, thing to notice. So uh, it's very convenient to work not with the size of the alphabet, but rather with log the size of the alphabet. This is the number of bits you need to represent a symbol. And we know that this should be log one over epsilon, but here it's polynomial in one over epsilon. So this is not the right trade-off. And this means that if you want the, the, the uh, alphabet to be polynomial, the best error you can get is this. So this is the explanation for what is written here and how 
this theorem implies it. Okay, so this is this is what we want to to prove. You also can get no most linear side, but you're not going to yes. Possible. Yes, that that's true. Um, no, I, I am going to uh, to mention it. So, <laughs> what? Yeah. Yes. So so efficiently converted is. <laughs> This is converted. Means really, so so he, this is like s this looks innocent, but it's not innocent. This is actually much better than I wrote here. Actually, we can have almost linear size conversion, which means that the new proof, the length of the new proof, will be almost linear in in n. And this is this is actually yeah, it's important. It's a this is a major advantage of this theorem over the parallel repetition because parallel repetition, even to get this error, it requires this length with a huge constant here. Um, so, so we get really almost linear length. Okay, thank you. This, this is important. Okay. So, so let's see what what we are going to do. Yes, and I think that here I. Switch to this. Fine. So, um, yes, but we want the alphabet to be polynomial and not log the alphabet to be polynomial. Because usually. No, no, I don't. Yes. Yeah. And, and the problem, uh, uh, I, I, I should tell you why. I'm saying that it's extremely important for us that the alphabet will be polynomial. And, and you ask why. You know, maybe we only care that we need polynomial number to represent. Yeah, no, so, so what happens is that, uh, so, you know, it is an interesting philosophical question how to define it, but, but uh, just from a practical point of view, we take this and we use it for hardness of approximation. And all hardness of approximation results, the first thing they do is take uh, like each alphabet symbol and replace it with some encoding, like with uh, an exponential size encoding. So, so uh, the length is going to be the size of the alphabet, usually even doubly exponential uh, encoding, but the, the for the very least, an exponential size encoding. So. It's really important for us that this will be logarithmic and not polynomial. And I think the, the, this header you wrote here looks somewhat different from the one over log n to the beta. No, so it's exactly the same because we want we want this to be polynomial. Okay. We want this to be polynomial, which so so this is two to the poly one over epsilon. So which we want two to the poly one over epsilon to be polynomial, we need that poly one over epsilon will be logarithmic which means that the error can be one over log n to some beta. Yes. Um, <coughs> so this is what we're going to prove. And now let me tell you how we are going to prove it. Uh, so the proof plan. And the proof plan uh, consists of two parts. One which I won't show you at least uh, not now, but uh, all talked about yesterday. And this is to get everything that we want, but uh, construction with super polynomial alphabet. Yes, yes, yes. This is the theorem we prove. What I'm saying is that, like the the definition that is accepted, like in in um, 
the literature is that we want polynomial length and polynomial alphabet. This is, this is the definition, this is uh, the convention we work with. In all, all of this list, the, the, the length is polynomial and the alphabet is polynomial. So this is the size of sigma, not the log sigma length. In all this list, this is the convention. But we actually proved this stronger theorem that says that if you're willing that the alphabet would be super polynomial, then everything is. So why is this to mean length is polynomial in n, in n and sigma is uh, polynomial in one? Oh, one. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. But no, the important thing is also, uh, yeah, I, uh, I that this will be. No, so. No, I, I really meant to, to write that this is at most polynomial in N. Really meant to write N in both. Okay? We don't accept alphabet which is not which is not polynomial. And it's actually so so you could say that you know it's a matter of definition, but actually for practical reasons, for hardness of approximation, it's really important that we have a polynomial. And and sometimes it's if, even important that we have logarithmic alphabet. Um, it depends what we do later. If, yeah, the long code is doubly exponential. The mod is exponential. Um, yes. Okay. Thanks. I was thinking now that basically, if you just give the entire proof, like it's a huge alphabet, like it's it's exponential. Yes. So, so to get exponential alphabet is is trivial because, as you can say, we can put all the proof into one yeah. symbol. But we don't want to talk about exponential alphabet. We only permit polynomial alphabet. Uh -huh. But that, that would be in line with this growth rate? Or so then, then you would get zero error, right? If, if you would put the entire yes. proof, then you would converge to yes, zero yes. or get zero. But so somehow there is a gap between, like you are just going to enter the gamma. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I, I'm saying this still, I'm, I'm not interested in getting error zero or getting error which is polynomially small beyond a certain threshold. I'm only interested in, in, this, in this threshold and, and, and the conjecture in the field is that this is the best. Up to the question, what is the gamma here? This is the, the best error that we can achieve you know, in, the, in the meaningful setting of, of uh, parameters and meaningful setting. So uh, the proof plan, there are, there are two parts. First, there is a construction with super polynomial alphabet. This is what uh, Or discussed yesterday. So there is a very, very nice algebraic construction, which is what Or called the folklore construction. And, and the reason that Or called it the folklore construction is not that it's easy or not that it's not interesting. It's actually, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful construction. But uh, for 20 years, so many people are working on that that everyone in the field knows it, so that's why it's folklore. Okay. And so Or showed you the, uh, combinatorial um, construction. Actually, he didn't show uh, in a self-contained way because he used your uh, theorem. But if you're interested, I can show you a self-contained algebraic proof. For this, this is the, the folklore uh, construction of all. Okay, but, but in this lecture, I'm not going to speak about how we do that. And we're going to assume that we have a construction with super polynomial alphabet. And you'll have to trust me that this is somehow, uh, well, that we can do it. Um, what we are going to talk uh, about today is how to reduce alphabet. So log the size of the alphabet would be polynomial in one of epsilon, which is what we promised here. Okay, so this is this is what we're going to do. Well, so all showed, yeah. I'm I'm willing. Like I, I gave last last week, I actually gave a very like 
a very fun uh, late night uh, talk about this. It takes about an hour. It's a beautiful, beautiful construction. It's not something to, to sketch, uh, like in five minutes. But, but uh, it's 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 sum check sum check is the main if if you know anything about but you don't have to use the flow flow construction you can start with with what all showed yesterday yeah um up to the fact that actually we need something stronger that as all said yesterday he still cannot achieve um but we will we'll discuss all those issues but essentially this is the part that all talked about yesterday but again what all showed is also not self-contained because he used your, your theorem. Um, and I, and um, I think that uh, the algebraic construction is actually, it's, it's easier. Um, I, I'll, I'll be happy to, yeah. Uh, but fine, we are not going to talk about this. We are only going to speak about this, uh, how to achieve. And, and by the way, this is completely combinatorial. All this, all this construction is completely combinatorial and it's very nice. Um, now, the, the alphabet reduction is going to be via composition. So composition in the, in the PCP jargon is uh, the analog for concatenation in codes. Um, so, so let me remind you, I want to speak about the parameters here. I just wrote qualitative something, things here. So, before we speak about the parameters, let's have this uh, an, um, an, um, analogous code setting in mind because the parameters will be the same. So let's, let's remind ourselves of uh, code concatenation. So a code is, uh, so we have is, is a bunch of strings and uh, we want, uh, um, uh, each two strings in the code to be uh, far from one another. And the question is, what do we do in the code setting when we have large alphabet here? When we have that log, the size of the alphabet, so log the size of the alphabet is, is this length here. So suppose that this is too large. What do we do? What we can do is take each uh, symbol and uh, encode it, oy, and encode it via uh, a smaller code. And the smaller code, even if we, even if we only have constructions where uh, the alphabet depends on n, but here n is much smaller. It's not uh, the, the length of the message we want to uh, um, to encode, but only log of, of uh, sigma. So what we have in the code concatenation setting is that the length, so we have uh, an outer code and an inner code, and we just replace each symbol with an encoding of it by the inner code. So the length is length, length of uh, composed. Length of composed is the length of the outer, where it encodes messages of size n, times the length of the inner, where uh, its n is not, is not n, but log sigma of the outer. So when you set a, a super polynomial, you really meant quasi polynomial. I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly what uh, I meant. Uh, yeah, but it's not too loud. No, 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 it is too loud. Uh, we, we, no, it depends on. It's a uh, sub-exponential. No, the question is how, what uh, the, the, the length you want to achieve. I'm going to say exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so, so the new length is multiplication of, of the outer length with the inner length. Uh, the, the distance doesn't deteriorate too much. And the alphabet size, so log, the alphabet of the composed, so this, uh, maybe I'll use colors, is log the, the alphabet of the inner, but, but the inner doesn't need to encode messages of, of, of length n, but only messages 
of length log sigma out, out term. Okay? So these are the parameters for concatenation, and we're going to achieve uh, essentially the same parameters for composition, the, the analogous thing for PCP, which is much more involved. So um, let's see, well, let's do it. Ugh. Okay, so, so uh, composition parameters so we're going to have yes, uh, the length will be essentially a multiplication length on, of the composed will be at least maybe polynomial in uh, the, the multiplication of the lengths, the length of the outer, when, when the original proof is of size n times the length of the inner, where the, the new n is log uh, sigma outer. So I'm, I'm not referring to polynomial uh, factors here. So th this uh, operation is much more evolved than the, the concatenation operation, and so uh, there are going to be things uh, added here, but all polynomial. So this is the length and the, the log of the size of the alphabet. So again, um, it's going to be log the size of the inner, but when uh, the, the n is log the size of the outer, just like in concatenation, but we are going to have uh, a factor which is polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Okay, so, so this is from here there will be the, the, this polynomial uh, trade-off that we spoke about before. And, and the error is going to be a polynomial in the outer error and the inner error. Okay. Was this well, the thing you talked about code, you talked about PCP, you didn't talk about uh, locally testable code. Can it be done directly on local? So uh, it requires an ad adaptation, and it's actually a work in progress. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so the parameters up to uh, this actually very important thing, the parameters are essentially the same as concatenation. If you see PCP, if you, you multiply the, the number of rand the, 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 the randomness with the Yes, but so it's not you add the length of the no, that's the oh added, added, not added. oh uh, the the question was about no 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 the, it's, it's added it's added it's, added. it's, it's not multiplied but the, but the size is going to be like uh, no like uh, we're going to talk about size and not about randomness but sort of uh, the size and the randomness are the same thing up to. The randomness is essentially log of the size. So uh, we don't really need to talk about both. Yeah, but what is that is I don't understand. So you have... The log is not added. I mean, if you want to, you, you talk about specifying the location. Then you have to add the log of the, you know, expand the... Well, you just take the log of the length. That's the <coughs> Which is the log of the outer length plus the log of the inner length. Log of what's this? Yeah, 
so I'm going to show you that. So, uh, yeah, go yeah. yes. So, so I'm, uh, we'll have a break, but I want to. Uh, so, so the question is whether this is good or this is not good. And for this, we have to know what are the parameters we get in, in one. So let let me do this, and then we'll we'll have a break. Um, we'll see. So so let's let's uh, understand what we have. So these are the composition parameters. This is about step two. So uh, what about the initial construction? What do we know? And actually, we know we know a lot. And so I'll, I'll uh, have a little uh, table. And the table will be constructions with length something and log alphabet something. So, so let me tell you what we know. Suppose we want to get almost linear length, where almost linear is 1, n to the 1 plus little o of 1. And this little o of 1 can can hide a lot of things, but this is our definition for almost linear. In this case, we can have the alphabet to be 2 to the uh, log of the alphabet, to be 2 to the log n uh, to the alpha for any arbitrarily small alpha we are interested in. Okay? So this is what we know if you want almost linear uh, size. If we are willing to have polynomial size, so we can achieve that the log of the size of the alphabet is much better, it's polylogarithmic. Okay. I think that these are the parameters that Or quoted yesterday because Or didn't want to speak about almost linear size, he only wanted to speak about polynomial size. But in any case, these are the two cases that are considered reasonable like polynomial, polynomial length. And know that in both cases, the alphabet that we get is super polynomial. Here it's slightly sub-exponential. Here it's really just, uh, the, the it's, it's just quasi-polynomial, the alphabet. Another thing that you should know is that if you're, if you're willing to have exponential length, we can actually do much better. We can actually get exactly the right trade-off. This is by a uh, demand uh, construction. So, so these two, it's actually the same construction, just there is a, a trade-off in the parameters and we can play with that. But this is the same construction. This is a similar construction based on a demand. So this is what we know in terms of parameters uh, for the initial construction. Sana, what's the relation epsilon For every epsilon, which is uh, at least polynomially small. So uh, the length is, uh, we always have poly 1 over epsilon here. So, and so epsilon can be uh, at most, c it has to be at least polynomially, uh, inverse polynomial in n, yeah. Right. So then the between this and, no, so, so it's actually very important to achieve a result that works for any epsilon. Because if you want to use the long code construction, you actually want log of the size of the alphabet to be not logarithmic, but to be log log n. Because the, the long code uses, is a doubly exponential uh, operation. So it's very important that we can uh, achieve various alphabets um, and various errors. Okay, so, so this is what we know, and uh, I'm saying that because this is what we know, and because we'll be able to show this, we'll be done. So, so how, uh, putting it together, so, so we're going to start with the almost linear size construction, and we're going to compose with the polynomial construction. Now, notice that in the, in the almost linear uh, size construction, uh, 
log of the size of the alphabet is n to the little of one. So the, the new n, the n that we care about for the inner, is just n to the little of one, which means that if the length is going to be polynomial in this, we don't care because this is still n to the little of one. So if we compose the almost linear size construction with the polynomial construction, we preserve almost linear size. And what we get is, um, is a construction where the log the size of the alphabet is this. Um, so all we care about is, is polylog, where the n is not n, but this uh, uh, 2 to the log n to the alpha. Yes, so, so this is poly log log n. Yes, so with one composition, so let me, so this is one, then we achieved this, still almost linear size, but uh, uh, log the size of the alphabet, like here the, the size of the alphabet is already polynomial. So this is already a, a good PCP. And if we want to achieve the trade-off that we wanted, we are just going to do another composition with... Uh, How do we get one log? Yeah. What? I see log n, log n, you plug in the data. Why is it separated log there? Poly log. Polylog. Yes, 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 yes. I just wanted to say that this is the most slogan. Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry. Yes, that's um, I should. Yes. Yes, we're going to pick alpha to be good, to be, to be sufficiently small with respect to this. And, and achieve, yes. So this is already a good PCP. If you want to get the, the trade-off that we wanted, we do another composition, but with the exponential construction. And then the, the we get alphabet, which is um, log one over epsilon, which is what, what we wanted. And, and still, so, so again, the, the length remains almost linear because, uh, so, so this is, yes, let's, let's take it, yes, let's, okay, fine. Square root of log n, I'm sorry. Yes, and then, so to get a, a factor which is exponential in this, it's still, uh, it's still fine. Good, good, okay. So, so the conclusion is that if we show these parameters for composition, then, then we are done up to uh, step one that maybe I'll do some, some other time. Okay, so, so let's, uh, what? Can we use this composition in just the exponential one to get the trade C1? What? No, but the exponential construction, the length is, is exponential, and we don't permit length which is exponential. Okay. Yes, so, so let's make a break of, of what, like five minutes or ten yeah. minutes? Five minutes and, and like, so, so 11.35. Then we'll start proving. Okay, it's a perfect uh, test. Uh, That's a very nice explanation, but I just want to ask. So, again, the number of random choices for the verifier. So, um, Okay, 
So we are, we are talking about uh, projection games. Okay, so um, right, we have the A part and we have the B part. And we have projections here. And we want to uh, reduce the alphabet. We said that maybe there are different alphabets, sigma B and sigma A. And the first step is going to notice, is going to be to notice that uh, reducing sigma B is actually, is actually easy. We can actually obtain sigma B is going to be really uh, poly 1 over epsilon. This is really the, the exact trade-off that we want, not the, the bad trade-off that we, we will have in the end, but we can really achieve the right trade-off to get sigma b exactly to be what we want in, in a, actually in a very easy way. A, B, M, N, R. What? A, B, M, N, R. No, 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 no. But, uh, but this we are really going to do via code concatenation. We don't need actually any uh, code wheels. Code with a uh, with a high distance will su uh, be sufficient. Okay, so so why why is that? So we're really going to to emulate the idea of code concatenation. So suppose that here sigma b is is really large. So to represent a symbol, uh, we need many bits. So the idea is that we can replace each such each such symbol in sigma b with an encoding just by uh, an error correcting code. So, so we'll assume that we have a code with a relative distance one minus epsilon to the C where C is some, should be two or three or something like this, some specific constant. So we have distance which is very close to one, depending on, on epsilon. Now, of course, to, to achieve such a large distance, the alphabet has to be a polynomial in one over epsilon. So this explains this. So what we're going to do is just replace each vertex here with a bunch of vertices that correspond to the encoding of this via uh, this code, and the, the new alphabet is going to be the alphabet of the code. And projections are defined in, uh, in the natural way, because each symbol here, so if there is a, an edge here, it means that it knows, it has an opinion given a value here on this entire thing. In particular, it has an opinion about all those guys. Okay, so, so in, if we had an edge here, we are going to replace it with, let's use some other color. So this is going to be this uh, code, the green code. And we are going to replace each edge here with edges to all the green uh, vertices. Right, and projection is defined, is defined in a natural way. Okay, so the construction is clear, and why it gives the right alphabet. The, the only question is why this construction is true. Okay, so, so let's do it. Let's try to, to draw a more beautiful picture. So, um, so in all the, the, the claims we'll see, it's all about counting counting edges and counting success probability and always it's going to be like a slightly different, like clever way to, to count. And the way that I want to count uh, the success probability here is to say, instead of talking about uh, the probability, I'm, I'm choosing an edge and the probability that A and B agree, I'm going to talk about the probability where I'm choosing two edges with the same B. And 
a1 and a2 agree on b. And, and what I'm saying is that up to uh, polynomial factors, these two things are the same. So yes, yeah, so, so on one side, so let's see. So this is uh, smaller than this and larger than this squared, okay? So if we don't care about polynomial factor, factors and we don't care about polynomial factor, instead of considering an edge, we can consider like two edge, edges that, so we have this. Let's concentrate on one B and two A1 and A2 that project to it and we replace this B with this encoding. Uh, and we know, if, if we know that this is small, so obviously in the good case, if we can satisfy all the edges, we can still satisfy all the edges in, the, in this construction. The only interesting case is the soundness case. So suppose that this is very small. Also this is very small. If we pick two guys, they're going to agree on an assignment here with very low probability. And if they're going to agree with very low probability, it means by, by the choice of, uh, of the code that they're going to disagree on, on most things here. So, right, they're going to disagree on, on one minus some epsilon, some poly epsilon. Okay, so, so that's it. This is, the, this is the proof. Okay, questions about this? Okay. No, no, no. This is just this code concatenation, actually. And know that we use the fact that the projection, we, we can only do this with the B vertices. We can do this with the A vertices. Because you know the value of the projection. Yes, because each guy knows everything. And yes. And now, uh, all the rest of the talk, the, the, the big, question that we are going to, uh, to, going to solve is uh, how to reduce sigma a. Okay. Good, so, so let's, let's do it. So before we do it, let me, let me tell you the steps of how we're going to do that. So I'm going to erase the, the parameters the parameters are the same as cold concatenation up to this and up to polynomial factors. In all, all those stuff are two oh, yeah. are, are projection games. So these are all uh, projection games. No, no, no. We are starting with projection games. If, if we're willing to start with something with more than two queries, we can achieve a, a polynomial alphabet and um, almost linear site, which is, which is interesting, but, but projection games are, are more interesting. Um, No, 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 no. I'm just, uh, I'm stopping where, the, what happened was that uh, we, to get the, the three, you start with two, which is projection game, and then you don't know what to do, so, so you add another query. So I'm, I'm just not doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm just starting with the, two, with the projection that I have and, and do this composition. And so we're going to have, so, so this is the, the micro uh, plan. So I want to reduce sigma a and to do something which is sort of like concatenation, but, but I won't be able to do concatenation. And what I'll, ab I'll be able to do is this. Uh, so first we, we will show how to reduce my degree. So I'm just, um, so right now uh, those titles don't mean a thing, uh, but, but I'm telling you uh, what's coming next. 
what's coming back is this uh, three-step uh, program. We'll reduce right degree, we'll uh, switch size, uh, sites, switch sites, and then finally we'll be able to do composition. So really this is what we want to do, but we'll need preparation before we are able to do that, and you'll have to bear with me while we do this uh, preparation. Okay. Okay, so, so let's start with a uh, high degree reduction. So what, what do I mean by this? So we have this uh, projection game, A and B, and projection going this way. And what I'll be able to do is to make sure that the degree here is polynomial in one over epsilon. Okay, so degree of all B vertices will be poly one over epsilon, and it's going to be the, the same polynomial. The graph is going to be right regular after I do this uh, operation. What? Uh, it's like graph product. Yes. So, uh, so how do I do that? So again, it's uh, it's ideas that uh, that are around the community like for for a long time. So so I don't have this. Suppose that I have this degree d, where d is huge. It can depend on n, and I want a degree which doesn't depend on n. Only depends uh, on on uh, epsilon, very nicely on epsilon. Um, maybe before I'll show you how to do that, uh, let's talk about the philosophical implications of, of this thing. Um, so, uh, yes. a nice way to view projection games is, so, so it's called projection games, and I, I never told you why, why it's a game, right? It's just a verifier picking edges. And so you can think of, of two parties, party A and party B. Uh, well, there is a verifier, the verifier chooses an edge and sends one, the, the A party, just the A uh, vertex, and the B party, just the B vertex. And it, it asks the A party, you know, give me the, the, what is going to be the symbol here, and it asks the B party what is the symbol here, and then it checks privately after it gets the answers that the projection is satisfied. So, so this is the, the way to view those stuff as, as games. Um, now, now what's, what's the idea? The idea is that each party knows what is the vertex it got. It doesn't know what is the, the edge that it got. If it knew what is, going, uh, what is the edge that the verifier chose. If it knew what is the edge, it would know what is the, the question of the other guy. You know, they could collaborate, they could, um, they could uh, make sure that this will be satisfied. But no, this guy only knows this and doesn't know the edge. So when we reduce right degree, we actually say that here, when, when uh, the B party gets the, its question, there are going to be only poly one over epsilon possibilities uh, for, for what is the question of, of uh, the A party. And a note that the degree has to be at least one over epsilon, because to satisfy one over the degree uh, edges is easy. This guy just needs to, to guess what is, the, what is the thing that this guy chose. So, so this transformation is essentially, is essentially optimal. We don't expect uh, more, and, uh, but we can achieve this, and we can achieve it uh, easily. What? It's it's coming from from here, but but we haven't seen yeah. yet. So, but this, so if you go this way, you must. 
Yes, so what we will do is uh, uh, the, the alphabet size is going, the, the alphabet is going to uh, store a, you know, a few bits about each of the neighbors, which means that log the size of the alphabet will be at least the degree. The degree has to be one over epsilon, and so this is what will happen. But sort of we're, we're skipping ahead. We haven't reached that step. Yes, the, the way we do composition is some specific thing that uses, uh, is a specific thing that has this uh, drawback. Okay, and that's what I was wondering, like if you do this, you must lose, you, you can't try to do similar constructions and hope not to lose this function. Similar constructions as in? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. So far, we are not doing anything that harms us. Because we are just without, all I'm saying is that without loss of generality, we can assume that the graph is right regular and, and the degree is polynomial in one over epsilon. Maybe we started this way. Yeah. All I'm saying is that if we didn't, we can uh, arrive at this point. Now, when here we don't lose a thing, what is going to happen is that we're going to use the, the degree when we do the composition, and here we're going to lose something. Okay. Yes. No, no, no. I'm going to explain it now. Yeah. Let me let me show you. So this is just graph product, the same like the way we build expanders, and the way so the degree reduction was was done before uh, by uh, Papa Dimitri Anakakis, I think, is the first um, the first uh, site. Okay. So so what we're going to do? So let's let's assume. So let's forget about this. Let's assume we, we start with uh, some degree, which is d. d can be huge. d can depend on n. We want the degree to be poly 1 over epsilon. What we're going to do is to take a Ramanujan graph. Uh, on d vertices. Um, so Romanujan already says what is the second eigenvalue, so it's essentially square root d. Um, yes. And the, uh, I'm sorry. D vertices and degree poly 1 over epsilon, and this, the, the, the second eigenvalue is square root d. Sorry. Yes. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is, uh, so every, if we have a graph, we can always think of it as a, as a bipartite graph, where we actually duplicate each vertex. Uh, one is uh, for the edges that go out of it, and one for the edges that go into it. Uh, okay. So, so we can, we can going, yeah, bipartite. Romanujan graph on, on D on D vertices. Good. So now we are going to do this thing. So we're going to t take each vertex here and replace this vertex with D new vertices. And these D new vertices are going to correspond to one side of this of this Romanujan graph. Okay. So this will no longer exist. The, the, new, the new B is just going to be replacing each one by those guys. OK, now, now I have to tell you how to uh, connect the edges of, of this thing. So each vertex here had D edges coming, uh, coming to it. We are going to identify each edge coming into it with the other side of the Ramanujan graph. Okay, so, so we have one side of the Ramanujan graph here and one side. So 
so that's me going the same way here. Okay, now we're going to connect according, so let's use this for the Ramanujan graph. So we have one side, another side, and we have some, the Ramanujan graph gives us a way to connect those things. And the idea is that we're going to take each edge that goes inside and replace it with uh, poly one over epsilon edges uh, according to the, to the graph. And this is going to be the composed, the, the product of those two graphs. Okay, uh, questions, should I? So I'm, I'm saving time but by not writing all those things. So at this stage, I'm not changing the alphabet size at all. Here, I, I even have the exact same vertices. Here, I have new vertices, but the alphabet is going to be the same sigma b we, we had before. And the, the idea is to, yes, I didn't tell you what are the projections. So we think of those d things as just copies of this guy. The, the, what the player b should do is really just put the same things for all of these, the same thing that he would have put here. Okay, so, so we think of all these as supposedly as copies of this. So the thing is that if we had a, some projection here, we're going to create the same projection on all the edges that, that are branched from, from this edge. And notice that uh, completeness is easy if there was a way to satisfy all edges before, there is still a way to satisfy all edges. The only question is why, although the degree here was just poly one over epsilon, why still we have soundness poly one over epsilon? And, and the idea is this. So again, another way to, to cleverly uh, count uh, the, the acceptance probability here. So what we know, we know that originally we were in the soundness case. Um, uh, we know that there was very little success. W what does it mean? It means that if we consider all the neighbors of this guy and we ask what do they say about this guy, then there are a bunch who say, you know, I want this value. And uh, there are a bunch who say, you know, I want that value. And there are those that say that they want, you know, some other value. But the idea is that uh, on average, all those things are really small. They are, they are only uh, epsilon fraction. Now, this we know just because we, we uh, kept the, the A's uh, from before. The problem is that now maybe before like the, the, the player, the B player had to uh, put here one symbol. And now it, it can, you know, it can play. It can put one uh, symbol for this set and one symbol for the other set. So, so it can, it can, those uh, things can, can have this and, and those can have this and, 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 and so on. And the question is whether whether this helps the, the provers, and then the, the answer is that, that no, it doesn't help the provers, and this is exactly where we use the, the expander uh, construction, because we are saying that you know these are only sets of, of fraction epsilon, so no matter what you do here, you won't be able like so so whatever you choose here that will be matching uh, the blue. You know, maybe epsilon fraction will go to the blue, but the rest will go to the other places that, that don't agree. Okay, so, so this is like the, the intuition. I can show you the, the analysis. Uh, it, it depends on you. I, I can say that, so it's essentially the expander mixing lemma where, where we bound the, the errors with uh, Cauchy Schwarz. So it's not, okay. So, fine. So, so. Mm -hmm. 
any set of notes on mm -hmm. the right within some additive error term or some some error term, mm -hmm. the number of edges between them is proportional to the product yes. of their sizes. Yes. So you're saying partition the notes on the left into the one you know, say we're given some value mm -hmm. to all the nodes on the mm -hmm. label to all the nodes on the left. Partition the notes on the left by that value. Mm -hmm. Yes. To be satisfied. Yes. So that also we have a partition of the nodes on the right. Into yes. The so these value. are the, the colors here. Yes. And then you say, okay, what now yeah. match up, look at the, the, the edges that are satisfied are those within the corresponding. Yes, between edges. blue and blue, so between the partition. Yes. And that has to be roughly proportional to the product of their sizes unless one term dominates. Yes, but, but we know that these, these are all very small by the property of, of the original thing. Um, well, how, do, how do we know that they're all very small? Because say, otherwise on the average, they are the all very small. The one that we would, we want to induce the labeling of the whole graph, of the original graph that has yes. one minus epsilon. If we take the biggest one, yes, yes. and that's our labeling, and all the others are smaller. Yes. So that yes. It takes like a, like, I don't know, two paragraphs to write it formally, but. Too much time. Yes, okay. <laughs> Fine, so, so this, is, this is step number one. Now, now we arrive at step number two, which is actually the main idea. And actually this step like, is, is what will allow us to reduce sigma a because really we only know how to reduce sigma b, the, the projected, uh, projected alphabet. And it seems that it gets stuck there, but, but this step is going to, to give us hope. So the idea. So the idea is to reverse the, the, uh, the direction of projection. Instead of viewing projection from A to B, we are going to view projection from, from B to A. And so the A side will be, uh, the A side, the, the, the side we really want to reduce its alphabet, it's going to be the projected side instead of the side that projects. Um, Okay. Fine. So let's switch sides. Um, and the idea is this. So so before we had we had A and B and projection used to go uh, this way. And now we want projection to go this way. So, so how do we do that? So basically, this is the same as um, this is duality, actually. It's like uh, in the projective plane, you have lines and points, and you can uh, connect uh, points to, to the lines that contain it. And you can consider it from one way or from the other way, points on line or lines or the lines that contain a point or the, the points that are contained in a line. So this, this is going to be a similar thing. So, so what we're going to do is this. We're g are going to uh, increase the alphabet of, of sigma b. A, a symbol for sigma b is going to contain, so this is going to be the degree which will be poly 1 over epsilon, a symbol to b is going to be uh, symbols for all the A vertices that neighbor B. Okay, so. What? What is the surplus to six sides? It's all a preparation. This will allow me to do composition. So a symbol here is uh, these symbols 
in sigma a, which are symbols to all uh, the neighbors uh, of, of this vertex b. And all those symbols will have to agree on a single assignment to b. On assignment to b. So, so we like to, uh, so we have a nice graphic way to uh, represent this. This is the, the sunflowers. So, so each, each label to A really gives you a label for uh, the neighborhood of A in the original graph. So we can think of each label for A as something that determines a, a neighborhood here. Right? This is just uh, the projection property the, of the original thing. Now, what we are going to do is that each uh, symbol here we look on all the neighborhoods that contain it. And all those neighborhoods, so all they contain it, so they have it as in them. Okay, and a, a legal symbol for the B vertex is going to be a, a legal symbol for each of the containing neighborhoods, for each of the A vertices, and they all have to agree on on a single value for, for B. Okay. Now, notice that indeed we got projection from B to A, right? Notice that we have completeness. If we could satisfy all the edges before, we can still satisfy all the edges now. Notice that we also preserve exactly the, the uh, soundness uh, of, this, of this PCP. Because we can still think of each label here as something that gives, a, in particular, a value for, for the original B symbol. And when we do the projection, in particular, we compare between an assignment uh, to the, an original assignment to the A with an original assignment to the B. You didn't lose information, just I just added information, I did lose the soundness could only get smaller, it couldn't, it couldn't get larger. I, in particular, I do the, the same test I did before. Uh, so the alphabet on the right, the alphabet on the right, it's a direct product of uh, alphabet uh, on the left, right? Yes, D yes. And so, but there is no way to de-randomize it to reduce the alphabet. Uh, so, so we don't know, like as far as we concern, so, all the neighborhoods that contain this B vertex, you know, we don't know anything. Like this neighborhood, th they, they don't have intersection as far as we know, besides the B. Actually, in, in the constructions that we actually have, they, they really, they rarely have intersections besides this B. So it doesn't seem that we can compress the, this information in, in any way. So, but this is exactly, like, if, if we can do it, then you know, we will be able to break this, this barrier. Um, so this is great. The, the only thing is that sort of, it seemed that we didn't achieve much because, so, so here the alphabet is still sigma, he, sigma A. Here, a uh, log of, uh, of the alphabet in, in, in the B side is, uh, D, which is poly 1 over epsilon, if we reduced right degree, times uh, log sigma A, well, this is the original thing. So maybe, you know, we, we know already that the projected side, we can always reduce the alphabet. So we can do this, reduce this to the right thing. But, but now we have sigma A popping in the, in, the, in the side that projects. So it seems like we didn't get anything. Uh, in fact, we only we only lost. But sigma, um, sigma B is always smaller than sigma A. No? Yes. So but now we lost sigma B. Sigma B. Yeah, now you lost, but yeah. we then increased it by a great deal. Right? Yes, 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 yes. We did something which is 
supposedly offer, but, but what we're going to do in the composition step is to reduce this. And thus, you know, we'll get, we'll get what, what I told you. This will be much smaller. Um, so this, this we know that we can reduce. This is going to be reduced as well, and we'll get stuck with this poly 1 over epsilon thing. Because we're going, so we have here neighborhoods that have nothing in common. So, yes. Um, okay. So this is the, the switching sides ID, and as, as an operation, uh, it seems like we didn't do a thing, but actually this is a major uh, conceptual step. Because we are saying, you know, it's all very flexible. We don't have to look at projection, you know, from this side. We can also look at projection from the other side. Um, both ways go, and, and this is the reason that we'll be able to do composition. Fine. Um, so now in our plan, we're finally going to do composition, which is really the, what we really want to, to get to. Okay. Um, fine, so, so I'll probably need a lot of space. Let me erase this. Yes. So why do we prefer the other side? Uh, no, no. All we pre uh, all we want is that we can side. play with it. We can do this side. We can do the other side. No, but, we no, this but now we have a structure. The degree on the right is already one over epsilon. That's really in common. Oh, so we don't know that. Okay. We don't know this on the other side. And, and the thing is that now we introduce the structure. We'll see that this structure is sufficient for composition. This is a very particular structure, the, the sunflowers thing. Okay, fine. So uh, let me just tell you what is, what is the overall idea. So... John, could you keep explaining again what, uh, how exactly the projection works now from B to A? I mean, what do you mean by writing... This, this guy has an assignment for all those guys. Yes. It tells them if you look here, you should find this value. If you look here, you should find this value. It's just a list of all the values. So it's a projection is written down as this. So uh, the idea is this. Here we have a, a symbol from sigma A, right? Sigma A, it's, it's not it's not trivial, but it's, it's still too large, and we want to reduce it. And now we want to do this test. We want to get, uh, we want to check that there is an assignment to the sunflower here, and there is an assignment here, such that those two uh, are consistent. So consistent means that here there is the same thing, and this thing is a, a, a valid a, a sigma A symbol. And we also need to make sure that um, all those things uh, agree on one, on one guy. So this is, this is the test that we have here. Now, the problem seems to be that we have to store this entire huge thing in order to do this test. But what we actually know from, from the PCP itself is that if we want to check whether you know, this, this is actually a big string. So we have two big strings, and we want to check that this is in sigma A. This is, you know, some property of strings. We know that we can check properties. We don't have to read the entire thing. We can just replace this with a small projection test that only checks uh, that this is a valid sigma A symbol. So this is the idea of, uh, of uh, composition. So we want... That it would be the same thing, but we want this to be a valid. Th the main thing is that we want this to be valid, and we want them to agree on. Yeah, on valid means, that valid means, means in sigma a. What does, uh, in the no, so 
what we are going to do is, is to replace each big thing with uh, lots of stuff. And now, we don't know that here we have a code word. Here we have something else, which can be an arbitrary string. And we want to make sure that it somehow corresponds to, to sigma a. But we know this is exactly what the PCP theorem gives us it, or the PCP te techniques. They give us that we can check that the string satisfies some global property by only making a projection test. So, so the idea is going to be to this, to replace this with, with an inner PCP. Okay, I'm going to, to do it uh, formally, or uh, like in drawings. Um, What? I'm going to do it on, on this structure. But before, before I actually do composition, I, I, I need to tell you that I kind of cheated because the inner construction, we don't only need that it's PCP, we need the PCP with, with an additional uh, property. So let's, let's talk a bit what, about what do we want from the inner construction. So the idea is that the inner construction not only will allow us to check that the string be satisfies some global property, but it, it should also allow us to decode a, a value from uh, this, this uh, bunch of values, a value that corresponds to this. So we can compare all those guys to this. I'm going to write formally what, what we want. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I need the, the stick. Um, so every symbol of A uh, projects to some particular symbol in B. What you want is to be able to decode that. To decode the, the, the symbol. Yes, the yes. So for this, we need an inner construction which we call uh, locally decoder reject code. And this is going to be some hybrid of, of PCP and uh, locally decodable code. Okay. So, so let me tell you what exactly uh, we want. Okay. So we want to be able to take a, a message X and encode it via, uh, so it's going to be very similar to what we already have, via uh, two parts, the, the A part and, and the B part, and each, this has sigma A and this is sigma B. And, uh, but, but uh, so this is so far is, is exactly what we had before. But now we also want to be able, the, the verifier not only, uh, so there are edges here, and the verifier, uh, okay, x should satisfy some, some property phi. Okay? And this property is going to be that uh, this is a, a valid sigma a symbol. And we want to make sure that uh, this corresponds to, to an x that satisfies a uh, phi by making only, by choosing an edge uh, at random and, and making a projection test. Okay, so far it's, it's the same as before. But the addition is that we also get an index in uh, this, this uh, thing. This is also, there is some alphabet here. And uh, the verifier is not just a verifier, it's a verifier that also decodes values. And the verifier, given uh, i, and so, so it's randomized, it's going to return, so it's going to return either reject, meaning, listen, I did a test, and the test does, just doesn't, doesn't work, it just fails. But if the test doesn't fail, it should return a value for, for xi. 
So it's going to return a value from, so it's reject union with, with sigma, so this is supposed to be some value for, for i. Okay, so let me tell you what exactly are the properties that uh, this object satisfies. So there is, there is completeness. Completeness means that if we uh, have x, so we have completeness. Suppose we have x, and x satisfies the, the property that is supposed to uh, satisfy. And we're, we're really given uh, some, so let's call it e, the encoding function. Some real encoding of uh, of uh, uh, x, of x, then for every index and for every randomness, vi must never reject and always return. It's always not reject, and it always equals xi. Yes, yes, I can just write this. Okay, so, so this is the completeness property. This is easy. Um, let's, let's write here, why not? Oh, no, I want fine. I don't want to, uh, like, we'll, we'll get to that. No, it's fine. The, the issue is what is the soundness uh, property? And the soundness property is that for every uh, y that we get, y, y a, and y a is supposedly e a, uh, y b, is supposedly e b, of x, but, but maybe it's some other string that we don't know what it is, there exists a list decoding. And the list decoding is, is x1 to xl, all satisfy the property. This is very important. And l, and l is small. Okay, so, sorry, for every yb and, and epsilon that we get, we can have l, which is order of 1 over epsilon. And what we know is that the probability over i and r that a vir is not reject and vir is some uh, value which is not in. So, keep, so this is x1 to xl. It's not uh, one of x1 i to xl i. So this probability is at most epsilon. Um, this is true for any y a, which is supposedly e a. Fine. For any code word we get here, uh, for any not code word, for any received word we, we get here, there is uh, this slight subtlety that the list decoding uh, it depends only on the B side, and we don't even need to look at the A side to decide about it. So this is actually needed. But essentially, we're given this received word, and we're given epsilon, the accuracy that, that we're interested in, and then uh, we can produce a list decoding of possible x's here, and we know that whenever we don't reject, we almost always return one of the, of the things in the list. Okay. So, uh, so I have all kinds of remarks about this. So first notice that we have to talk about list decoding, because maybe the received word is in this part, we, we uh, behave as the encoding of x1, and in this part, we behave as the encoding of x2, and, and so on. We have to talk about the, the notion of, 
of least decoding here. We can't guarantee just one, one x. And what we are saying here is that whenever we return something, it's really, it's really from the list, and the list is of, of legal uh, code words. And notice that this is really a hybrid of, of uh, PCP and, and locally decodable codes because, so we have here some test, and the test checks that we actually read from something that satisfies the global property. And we, we actually decode a value. Um, but notice there is a major thing here that we have probability on, on the index. In locally decodable codes, the, the property that we are interested in is that for every index that we get, although some of the symbols were corrupted, we can still decode it. Here we are not interested in any such thing. It's completely okay that, that symbols, you know, if, if there was noise that corrupted some indices, fine. So we don't know how to decode them. This is okay. The only thing is that we, we have to know about it. So this is a major qualitative difference between locally decodable codes and, and those objects. Okay? This is locally decodable codes. We only have sub-exponential constructions, and here we have almost linear uh, constructions. And, and really, if, if we just consider the locally decodable code settings where the noise is, is just like a small change, a change of, of small fraction of the, of the, mess of the code world, then Obviously, we can, uh, we can reconstruct, we can decode uh, almost all the, the indices. So uh, it's a, it's a, uh, the, the nature of the, of the problem is, is very different. But what we achieve is, like locally decodable codes, a decoding of a, of a message index. OK. Um, questions about this? Yes, so those objects can be constructed along the lines of, uh, of the, the construction if in, the, in, the, in step one. The, the almost it's the same construction. You need to modify it and, and see that you can also yes. get this. And what Orr said yesterday is that they don't know right now how to achieve this, but they're working on that. How to achieve it in the combinatorial way? How to achieve it in the combinatorial way but to achieve the this? Way in the algebraic way, uh, the same techniques give this. Okay, so, so I don't have enough time, but uh, let me tell you how, when we have this, we can do uh, composition. I is the index in X that you want to uh, decode. Yes. It's not going to be a bit, it's going to be a symbol from some alphabet. Yes. So finally, how do we do uh, composition? So I'm going to do it in a drawing, and um, I don't have enough time, but, but we'll see. Fine. So, so let's draw in the middle the original uh, sunflowers construction that we had. So we had the A part here and the B part here. And each uh, A vertex, I, I denote with this uh, blob that, that corresponds to, to the neighborhood. So each A vertex is actually a neighborhood of original uh, B vertices before I did all those uh, operations. And each B vertex is a sunflower that contains a bunch of D guys from here that uh, intersect on. These are not values, these are just names of vertices. What? These are not values, these are names of vertices. So these are names of vertices, and, and the names suggest uh, what is the value that is supposed to, to sit here. The value that is supposed to sit here is a value for each of those neighborhoods that agree if on. You knew the value in X. What? If, if given values for A, then you know. Without values, Circles on the left, on the A side, are names of vertices or, or the values in these vertices? 
There are name of names of vertices, but what the, the, the provers are asked by the verifier to do is to put here the, the, a, a proper value for, uh, for the A vertex. And, and to answer here, D values that agree. Now, we know that here, the, the size of, of the alphabet for each of these guys is sigma A, and sigma A is too big, and we want to reduce it. And we want to reduce it user, using an inner construction. Now, what we are going to do is to take each, so this is, this we are going to think about as, as a message. And we are going to encode this message, so we, we are going to use the inner uh, locally decode or reject code that we have, and decode this guy with a bunch of, uh, of vertices that correspond to the B side in the locally decoded or reject code. So this is um, LDRCB. Okay? So each, for each uh, guy here, we introduce all those new vertices. Okay? So this is just like the concatenation. Each vertex is, com is replaced with many new vertices. And uh, the alphabet is going to be uh, sigma B of, of the LDRC. Okay. Now, uh, we want to replace the, the B vertices. And we're going to replace the B vertices. Um, so each, each guy like this, so let's draw the original uh, sunflower. We're actually going to take like a sub sunflower. So what, what does this mean? So we, we're actually going to replace this with something that corresponds to A of the LDRC. Okay? Now, um, okay. So, so each, each guy here corresponds, is the, the, the name of each guy here is a, an original sunflower plus some uh, A vertex in the LDRC. And the A vertex in the LDRC tells you for each of those encodings what is, uh, you know, what is the, the um, what we should uh, read from this encoding. Yes. Let me, okay. We have uh, B of the LDRC here, A of the LDRC here. We are going to connect those two things with the LDRC graph where we want to decode I, which is the center, uh, this center. Each petal of the, like each, each former A vertex, yeah. I'm going to encode via the, the LDRC. And I'm going to replace this with the, the B part of the LDRC. And I'm going to, to replace this part, the, the part that appears in the, in the, in the B side, with the, the A side of the LDRC. The <laughs> yes, when it's kind of... Every petal is replaced by the whole LDRC. Every, every yes. side. If, if B comes into the interpretation of one projection to use, you're not actually using the B vertices. I mean, LDRC is defined on a string. The string is, 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 is this, yes. Exactly, yeah. I'm going to, to invoke the LDRC construction with this message. Okay, and, and I'm going to get something. And I'm going to switch to, to, uh, to, to give the B part, put it here, and the A part I'm going to put here. Okay? And what's going to happen is that, um, uh, and, and I'm going to connect edges, I'm going to connect all the edges that can uh, decode this guy, which is just a, an index in this string. No, 
so, so the idea is that for every petal, uh, so, so um, a symbol for, for this won't be just uh, a symbol for the, for the A uh, vertex of, of this petal, but it will be uh, a symbol for the A vertex of, of this petal and this petal and this petal. What? The, s the sunflower is the uh, assignment to the neighbors of, of this guy. And a symbol here is going to be the symbols in a sigma A of the LDRC. For each petal in the sunflower, I'm going to put information about the A vertex here, and the A vertex here, and the A vertex here. OK? And note that this is the, the bad dependency that we had before, that we have this poly 1 over epsilon. OK? So at least as far as the, the parameters go, the, the parameters are, are as promised. The length multiplies because each uh, vertex is, is is replaced by uh, the, the small encoding and the, the alphabet is this, is, this is the new alphabet. And now a note that, so this actually probably takes some uh, more than the, the, the five minutes that, that we have, or that we had. Um, we really, if we, if we have this construction, if, if we have this uh, property, right? so, so phi, the, the, the property we're interested in is that uh, um, we get uh, symbols from sigma A. So this is the property, and this is the message. And each subgraph is according to the index that we are interested in, in decoding. And we know that on average, we, we did uh, really something from a, a valid uh, guy here. Um, so we really just implement the, the outer uh, check that we were interested in with this inner uh, construction. The inner construction guarantees that we read from valid uh, sigma a symbols, uh, and we can decode this, and, and the symbol is these symbols in uh, ADRC. All those things, uh, they give, all those guys know how to decode the center, give decoding of center. And we, we ask that uh, there will be consistency. So this is how we, we check this property. So notice that uh, we, we made a central use in the, in the sunflowers um, structure. Fine. So the same value. Same value. Uh, give the coding of center in in, um, in sigma b, in the original sigma b. Yeah, that's it. Now it takes some time to go over it carefully and, and make sure that everything that everything works. But we really just implement the outer check with this uh, inner LRC. Good. Questions? Uh, yes. So, so you view a symbol from sigma A as a, as a sequence of symbols from sigma B? Yes, because a, 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 symbol, sigma, a symbol from sigma A induces assignment to its neighborhood. OK. So, OK. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I should, I should have done that. So we have, so suppose we have this uh, value from, from sigma A, okay? 
And this value from sigma a, it gives a bunch of, um, like lots of uh, sigma b values. Okay, so we actually have this, uh, okay. But if we just, cons so, so this is going to be our x. Our x is going to be this and not, and not this. But we are going to, uh, the, the property, phi, phi, is going to be that all this corresponds to a single symbol from sigma a. That there is a single symbol in sigma a that this is its projection. And now the center just sits here, like each center sits somewhere. No, so this is just a sigma a is is uh, the same for all a vertices. Yeah, but the, like you say, a signal, a symbol. Okay, fine. Yeah, you're right. It depends. It depends on on what exactly are the projections. What exactly are the the a? What are the projections? But fine. Like for each guy, we know what is the a vertex. Right. So. So it's specific to this A vertex, yes. Just creating another graph in this new graph, the new projections could be written again. And in the LDRC, so we only need to read one vertex in the A side of the graph. And one so vertex in the, one I'm, I just need to, to do a projection thing. The projection makes the test and decodes a value. And, and the reason this is possible is that the, the, alpha, the original alphabets are, are large with respect to, the, the new alphabets are large with respect to the original alphabet. 